Oh, good. You can start. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you for staying around till the last day. So we are going to change gears a bit and we are going to go and talk again about electron phonon interactions. And in particular, we are going to discuss today two modules that are implemented in ECW that allows us to calculate superconducting properties. So I will discuss about this. And then the second part of this lecture will be given by Samuel Ponce that um, will present the transport model. So uh, since a lot of people have asked uh, where is Binghamton, I just quick view of up, uh, New York State. So this is New York. So we are somewhere here at the boundary with Pennsylvania. And just kind of a couple of interesting things is that IBM started in Binghamton. And that's where also the place where, where the flight simulator was invented. And the uh, most recent thing is that in 2019, Professor Stanley Whittingham got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, along with uh, John Budina and Akira Yoshimo for their work on uh, lithium ion batteries, just yes? that related to everyday life we, we've been all of us uh, affected. So um, just to start with, I will review slightly the, just briefly, the computational, uh, computational flow of electron phonon matrix elements in ETW. And uh, since not everybody here is doing superconductivity, I will just give a very brief overview of BCS theory and then a bit more details about Eliasberg formalism of superconductivity, which is implemented in ETW. And at the end, I will just show two short examples, one of which, one of, uh, which will be used in our first tutorial uh, today. Yes, just to get started, you have already seen this in uh, Tuesday uh, presentation given by Professor Feliciano Giustino. So what EPW does, it uses Banier functions to convert for coarse grids uh, in, uh, that are calculated with quantum espresso. Then we, we use Banier 90 as a library and then we go and we will see we will calculate things in the real space. And then from here, we can convert back to dense, um, any basically mesh in um, uh, very fast, uh, very fine uh, meshes. So um, as you have already uh, seen, this is basically the quantity that we are calculating. And this is the uh, electron phonon matrix element. And these two parts here are the lattice parts, the periodic parts of the, uh, the wave function. And this quantity in the middle, this is our deformation potential that we calculated with density functional perturbation theory in quantum espresso. And it involves the displacement of every, every atom in the unit cell according to a phonon frequency. Yeah? So the good thing about the FTP is that you don't need to use supercells if you do it in a frozen phonon approach but you can do all the calculation in a unit cell. And this is because uh, we have here this phonon uh, modulation, yeah, which is showing me uh, in yellow. So once uh, you have calculated the, uh, 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 basically the deformation potential, you did a phonon calculation with quantum espresso, you can use this information and we can, uh, sorry, my mouse works very slowly. And then uh, we can move on to the EPW code. And the first thing that we do, we estimate the, 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 we estimate the electron phonon matrix elements in the real space. Yeah, so for this, we evaluate this object again. And as you have learned already on Tuesday, the good thing is that Vanier functions are localized. So whenever, uh, these three objects, if they happen to be far away with respect to each other, the electron phonon matrix element is going to be zero. So what it means, it means that you don't have to calculate uh, hundreds of thousands of electron phonon matrix elements. 
in order to estimate the electron phonometrics elements in real space. Yeah, so this is going to be um, cheap. And once you have the quantities in the real space, we can go back to the to any fine meshes uh, in the block space and estimate electron phonometrics elements. Yeah, so in a um, kind of or what how this will happen in the code, we basically have some input keywords that you will see that in, what it does in practice is leaves the um, the vanier, uh, sorry the wave function and some data from uh, the pw.x uh, executable of the quantum espresso then we generate in our input file you can do it directly you don't we don't do it in separate uh, vanier files we have keywords the same as in Vanier 90 to generate uh, the inputs for Vanier 90 and perform Vanierization. And the main kind of subroutine that is this electron, uh, electron shuffle wrap that calls first um, electron shuffle and then read the DSDF. So this main you already suggest calculates, it deletes the um, DVSCF files created with uh, quantum espresso. And in this subroutine, we first calculate the electron phonometric elements on the coarse grid, yeah, on the block coarse grid. And then we perform. Uh, so this is another like, main subroutine where we transform the electron phonon vertices and all the other quantities. Here I just wrote just electron phonon vertices, but uh, we, uh, from the block to Vanier and then from Vanier uh, back to block. So once you have this electron phonometric elements in the confined reads in the uh, block representation, we can calculate other properties like transport and superconductivity and the uh, optical transitions. And uh, more recently, uh, polar on will also be available in, uh, in the code. Yeah, so, so what you need to keep in mind that is when you are going to uh, perform calculation with quantum espresso, you are going to do a few expensive calculations, relatively expensive calculation when you do phonons, but then in principle, you can go on very dense meshes to this uh, Vanier Fourier interpolation technique. So now, just a few words about uh, the superconductivity in general and uh, more particularly about the PCS here. Yes. So superconductors, as everybody knows, uh, have zero resistance below uh, critical temperature. And the first microscopic theory of superconductivity was proposed by Bardeen, Cooper, and Schiffer. And their assumption was that there must be some kind of attractive uh, interaction between electrons that compensates the Coulomb compulsion. And in conventional superconductors, this attraction is brought about uh, by form, so in other words, by lattice uh, vibration. Yeah, so this is just a feature I believe from Wikipedia where you can see this as an electron moves to a crystal, creates a deformation potential yeah, because the electron attracts the, the ions, and then another electron with opposite momentum and spin will be attracted in this region of the most uh, positive potential. And that's uh, because of this, the two electrons become correlated and form what is called a Cooper pair. Yeah, so diagrammatically, this is represented in the following form. You have a, an electron of momentum K, which absorbs a phonon, and then the same, this phonon is, uh, sorry, emits a phonon, and the same phonon is going to be absorbed by another uh, electron of, as I said, momentum minus K, and uh, the first electron is going to scatter in a new state k prime, and the uh, first, sorry, the first electron and the second would scatter in a new state of momentum minus k uh, minus k prime. Yeah? So these two electrons or these two pairs, we say that the electrons scatter on each other by exchanging a virtual uh, phonon. And for this transition to take place, we need to have the, the original pair. And the final pair to be in the vicinity of the uh, Fermi lab. Yeah, so the first pair needs to be occupied, and the second pair needs to be uh, empty. So, if um, so, an important 
let's say, a result of the DCS theory is that because of this exchange of phones, what we will see is we will see an opening of a gap in the normal state of a metal. Yeah, so this is a metal. This is uh, how the, the band structure will look like. Yeah, we have no gap here. That everything is occupied below the Fermi level. Everything is empty above. And um, now in a superconductor, the fermions do not behave, uh, sorry, the electrons do not behave as fermions anymore since they form the super pairs that basically they behave as bosons. So as a result of this behavior, we can have more than one electron in the same state. And this results in the opening of this gap. And what you see, because of the electrons that have initially occupied this state, now they cluster uh, uh, here, and then you have this sharp increase in the density of states. Yeah, so this is something that can be measured experimentally. And uh, um, this gap that opens has a temperature dependence. Yes, yeah, so this is the BCS um, expression for the superconducting gap, where here V is the sparing potential. and E and K is just the quasi particle excitation energy that you can see is shifted by this uh, uh, by the by the gap. And the property is that the gap has a maximum value at uh, zero Kelvin <clears throat> and um, vanishes at the critical temperature. Yeah. So once you exceed, you go above the critical temperature, the gap closes, and you are again in a normal state of a matter. Um, so the BCS is a phenomenological method uh, or, or formalist. It's, it's a descriptive theory, and in other words, it's material independent. Yeah, so it has this well-known expression that the ratio of the gap, two or two times the gap to the critical temperature, uh, is 3.53. And another, um, I would say, drawback of the BCS theory is it assumes that the interaction between electrons and phonons is instantaneous, uh, while in, in practice this is retarded in time. Uh, so now I'm going to move a bit years, and there will be a few slides with a lot of equations. So uh, you don't have to understand everything, so don't get scared. I just want to give you an idea about the uh, what's behind the equations that you are going to uh, that are implemented in the code and uh, are solved in order to get the superconducting gap. So we, uh, in this case, what we are looking for is to find a two by two generalized matrix green function. And this green function is basically used, as you will see in a few slides, to describe both the propagation of uh, the quasi particle and of the superconducting Cooper pairs on an equal footprint. So that's very similar to an expression that Feliciano showed on uh, Tuesday. The only difference is now that they have these heads here. And this, in my case, um, um, uh, um, points that these are matrices. Yeah? And tau, uh, t tau as before, this is the uh, uh, weak uh, time ordering operator. And psi is a two component field operator that contains the annihilation and the creation of an electron at the state um, uh, nk. So if you just plug in this uh, two component operator in this expression, you will get basically this two by two uh, matrix. Yeah? So in this case, you can see that the diagonal parts are both in the same state nk, oh, sorry, the two components c and c plus for the diagonal parts in the same state, yeah, c and uh, uh, spin up, while for the non diagonal parts, you have the CNK spin up, CN uh, minus K and spin down. Yes, yeah? so the spin and the uh, momenta are uh, inverted. So the diagonal part basically corresponds to normal state Green's function and describe single particle excitations for electrons and poles, while the off diagonal elements are called the anomalous Green functions. And they describe the Cooper pair. So again, in the super, uh, if you are in the normal state, these two components of diagonal components become uh, become zero. 
as we already seen in a few talks, I think Sophie's uh, talk also discussed with the Scudia transforms is uh, more convenient instead of working in a, a, a imaginary time. You can play, uh, perform a, a Fourier uh, transformation in which you can go in this uh, Matsubara frequency or imaginary uh, Matsubara frequency space. So again, this is just the transformation, how the uh, matrix elements uh, uh, are written in, uh, in the imaginary frequency uh, axis. So uh, let's uh, get a bit into more detail. So the Basically, the bottom line is to find we need to find the Green's function that describes the superconductive state. And the starting point is again the electron uh, electron uh, self energy. So again, if I wouldn't have the head here, this would be the same as uh, and these tau matrices, which are the Pauling matrices, this would be the same electron self energy that you've seen for the normal state. So the um, this uh, here, I just wrote it in a, a condensed form, is the anisotropic electron phonon coupling, but basically it contains the phonon uh, propagator, the bare the phonon propagator multiplied with the uh, uh, electron phonon matrix element square. You will see the expression in a couple of slides. And when you multiply this with the uh, uh, interacting Green's function, you basically get this fun migdal self energy that was uh, um, also discussed uh, on Tuesday. And the second term, this is the Coulomb interaction. Yeah, so this would be the GW self, uh, self energy. Yeah, so you have the two components that you need to take care of. Well, the self energy is the electron phonon interaction and the electron electron uh, interaction. And the what we are looking to do right now is to solve this equation self consistently, but in order to do this, we, not, we need to find an expression for the uh, for G, yeah, for the interacting Green's function. So, to do this, we need to remember that uh, the Green's function obeys uh, a Dyson equation in Matsubara space. So, in this case, we can uh, write the expression for, uh, for interacting Green's function. This we can plug in the uh, G naught is the non interacting Green's function. And for sigma, we are going to see a bit the meaning again a bit later. We write this sigma in terms of three scalar functions as a linear, uh, 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 in, in, in linear dependence of uh, uh, power matrices. Yeah? So Z here is the mass renormalization function. You have again already heard about the uh, mass renormalization function a few talks this week. Uh, the sky is just an energy shift from the Fermi level. In general, it's very small. And here, this delta is uh, the superconducting gap function. Yeah? So when we are going to uh, solve, basically, this Eliasberg formalism in, uh, in, in the code, you are basically calculating these quantities, Z, chi, and delta. And so now, we plug in this two expression in the Dyson equation. If you invert this G matrix, <coughs> you will get the following expression for, for the green function. You again plug it in back to our original expression. And if you now equate the two terms from the from the two expressions from the self energy, you will get what they are called the anisotropic and the equations. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, this is my part. So you can see that these equations need to be <coughs> solved consistently since we have Z entering both in the, on the left and on the right, the same here, chi and this both in the left and the right. As I told you, this chi is simply an energy shift, you see that these are the energy levels with respect to the Fermi level, and this is just a shift and the same for delta. Yeah? So we need to solve these three equations self consistently at the same time. And there is an additional equation for the electron number in order to uh, find out or to find the, the Fermi level. And this is a new implementation that is not available 
in the source code that you are going to use today, but it will be available in the next release of Quantum Espresso, which will be at the end of May. Now, so to, um, to start these calculations, you basically will need this um, input slides. So one thing to notice here is that the Coulomb interaction only enters in one of these three expressions. Yeah, only it enters in the expression for the uh, superconducting gap because all the other effects that come from the electron electron interaction in the normal state should be already included in the uh, in the uh, single particle of eigenvalues yeah, in this epsilon. Okay. One thing that I should also I should have pointed out earlier, but I forgot, is that the phonon, electron phonon interaction, and the electron electron interaction are on two different energy scales. So, in other words, when we do this summation over the mass bar frequency, we need to have a cutoff. Yeah, we cannot have an infinite sum. And the cutoff of the electron phonon interaction is of the order of five to 10. Uh, uh, the, the by frequency, or in other words, you can take it the largest phonon frequency in your system, but the Coulomb interaction is of the order of um, 10 uh, electron volts. Yeah, so you go from a scale of milli electron volts to a scale of uh, uh, 10 electron volts. And I will come back to this point um, uh, in the next uh, in the slides. So now, as I said, this is a new implementation. What was done before and what it was in general implemented uh, was standard is to assume that the density of states is constant near the Fermi level. So this allows some simplification. So we can do, we can uh, solve, uh, we can integrate this analytically. And then you can show that this chi is basically zero. And uh, then this n. Um, it's also zero yeah, because it all depends on chi. And what you uh, are reduced to is only to two equations that we call them now Fermi restricted. Yeah? And you can see that there are these delta functions. So in other words, these equations are valid only within a Fermi window around the uh, energy window around the, the Fermi level. And the key one, and another thing that I have. Uh, the change here is that we don't have a full Coulomb interaction, and I will comment this in a moment, but we have a, a, a semi empirical parameter. And so, this lambda, as I said before, this depends on the electron phonon matrix element, and this term here, this is just the bare uh, phonon propagator, and that's a quantity, the quantity that can be efficiently calculated with um, EPW. Now, regarding the Coulomb uh, interaction, that's something that uh, we'll work on uh, in, in, in the future. We, uh, we, uh, we are planning to implement this, but currently you can uh, you pick this as a parameter is given in the code. So for most uh, superconductors, it's considered that it's for, uh, it falls somewhere between 0, 1 and 0, 2. In principle, you can calculate it or uh, using uh, RPA or uh, from GW codes like Berkeley GW or Sternheimer GW or ELK. Yeah. And then you can use this Anderson uh, model uh, potential to reduce, basically, to reduce the screen Coulomb interaction to this parameter, which is called new star. Yeah, so by making this strongly reduced Coulomb repulsion, what happens that effectively you are able to reduce that. Uh, cut off in the Matsubara frequency that I said that should be of the order of the 10 electron volts, you can reduce it at the same scale um, with the frequency over um, the electron formator. I think I should uh, think, uh, try to speed up a bit. So, just as a conclusion, you can this uh, couple equation need to be solved at every temperature. Yes, yeah, so you see that you have here the T. And um, they must be evaluated on dense, in general, dense electron and uh, phonon key meshes to properly describe an isotropic effects. And then you need to have this sum over the Matsubara frequency. That, uh, and then uh, for this particular case, if you only solve the two, they are only meaningful for states 
or near or at or near the ferry service. Yeah. And you will see in the code this are the, uh, the input flags to perform this, uh, these calculations. So uh, if you want other quantities like spectral representations, then you need to go from the imaginary axis to the real axis. So in order to do this, you will need to perform an analytic continuation. This can be done in two ways. This is a very cheap way to do a the approximants. And in most cases, it works um, relatively well. Or you can use an iterative procedure, um, but this is very heavy computational. Yeah, so for, um, it, it, right now, I would say that it's all, you, you need to use it on like thousands of uh, uh, processes if you, if you want to use it. It's, it's extremely heavy. So with this, I, I said that I will give two examples. And this is the example that I, we are going to use in the exercise today. Yeah, this is the prototypical phonon mediated superconductor MGB2. And the reason why I'm showing you this example, because this is a uh, two gap superconductor. Yeah, so as you, you will find, there are two sets of uh, states at the Fermi level. What is shown here in red, which are the sigma states which are uh, formed because of this boron layer, yeah, the sp 2 hybridized uh, level, levels. And then you have also phi states shown here in green that form this Dirac cones, one below and one uh, above the perimeter. And the important uh, characteristic, I would say, of MGB2 is that it has this cold dot uh, uh, sigma band. Yeah, you see that the levels are just above the Fermi level. Yeah, if this, state will be completely filled, then you are not going to uh, uh, it will destroy superconductivity in, uh, in this compound. And if you solve the set of equations that I'm going to show, you will get two gaps. Yeah, so this, are, this is an old plot, original plot uh, from 2013. And um, if you look at the distribution of the Fermi circuit, you see that one gap, the lower gap comes from the phi states, and this upper gap comes from the sigma state. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of the study, but um, a number of uh, uh, recent papers have used PW to look at the hydride. So this is an example of a paper from Lilia's Boeri group, a group where she proposed that, um, so La uh, Landenum, uh, sorry, uh, Landenum hydrogen was predicted to be a superconductor in 2018, and then it was, um, indeed found experimentally, but I think the pressure there is way above 100 gigapascal, like 150 or so. So one idea to lower the pressure is to introduce another element that will basically give some ex this, um, internal pressure that in, in, uh, in, uh, instead is going to help reduce the external pressure that you need to apply. So recently, they proposed that um, by introducing um, uh, land, uh, land, uh, land, yeah, I think they put land, uh, then uh, they may uh, reduce the pressure to 50 gigapascal and still have superconductivity above uh, 100 kg. So before I will let uh, Samuel uh, take the spot, I just want to uh, mention a few things that if you want to estimate, you may not always need to do an isotopic superconductive, uh, superconductive calculation. Most time, it may be enough just to do isotopic, uh, but um, you need to do at least a rough, let's say, investigation of the anisotropic lambda to get an idea if uh, you may have anisotropic properties or not. But in, in order to do that, you need to, uh, to use a fine sampling of the electron chromatic elements. And, uh, I uh, just want to mention that we are going to have, so I don't expect if you haven't used TPW before, uh, one hour uh, to discuss transport and all, to discuss personality, it's very short, but we are also going to have a TPW school in Austin. And uh, what I mentioned here, because all materials in general that we use from the school is going to be recorded and initially it will be placed on the website of the school, but later on it will be moved to um, to the EPW website. In fact, if you go to EPW website, maybe somewhere is going to show, there are uh, already 
um, there is documentation and lectures and uh, presentations from the previous schools that we had. And finally, um, people that are interested in co-development and uh, um, I have a postdoc position that I'm looking to fill in here. Uh, and this is uh, basically on development of EPW, and that's a collaboration with uh, Feliciano and with uh, Professor Louis uh, Berkeley, and then with Texas uh, Supercomputing Center. With this, I can uh, either take questions now, Antimo, or. You can or... look questions. Okay. But maybe we can pick up this. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I have a question that okay, a long time. So if you go to the beginning of the derivation of the mentality of permutation, you define a green function which is this matrix of one particle green function. But if I think about who prepares as a bound state of two electrons, I would think that to describe it is in dynamic. I would need to use a two particle green function. And this way, it will be able to show that we can get around that by using the off diagonal green mm -hmm. function. Is there any, what, what, is there a fault in how I understand this thing? Or is there some uh, approximation that you made along the way and you haven't shown it? Uh, in this derivation, there, there is no other approximation. So you, so, you, you, but there is another way to, to arrive to these equations through yeah. basically using uh, uh, just uh, dynamics. Uh, I, I, I think if you uh, look um, Massidio's derivations, he, he has a couple of papers where he follows the other uh, the other formula. So th this is in the uh, Nambu Gorkos formulas. So I think mathematically it's easier to, to follow. Yeah. No, but, I so, yeah, I, I I try to follow the mathematics. Yeah, it's just on the physical physical picture. So if I have a full prepare which is two electrons, I would expect that its dynamics is explained by the green function that describes the two particles. So instead of having two uh, creation and creation operator, I would have to have four. And I see. That, so that he, it's a quantum yeah. particle. So here we go. Yeah. It's a new object. It's yeah. The two particles. So yeah, one object. So you work yeah. with a pair here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I would have one green function that describes everything, and then from each uh, property, I could deduce what is the uh, where the gap opens at this temperature and so the pair of electrons from yeah. one object. Yeah, this is why you, you describe it one with one green function. Yeah, so this is why you don't have two. Yeah, understand. Is there oh, is there an approximation that you make that you go from here to there? No. Okay. As I said, it's yeah, yeah. something that we can use. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Do a different talk so that we'll stop the recording and do a, make oh. a new one. Okay. So they know it's the, the okay. video. Stop. Okay.